Uh, good morning. Um, it's a great pleasure to be here. Um, I'd like to thank the organizer for uh, inviting me today to present my, my work. Um, so today I will talk about predictive coding in a rather unconventional way, I guess. Um, and I will tell you how to surprise the brain. So predictive coding and, and related Bayesian accounts um, now clearly predominate as explanations of how perception work. There's a wealth of experimental evidence in favor of these theories. Um, so this presentation aims at proposing that studying vocal communication can provide useful insights about the neural mechanisms underlying predictive coding in the brain. So it's basically um, trying to do neuroscience with a microphone to start. All right, so according to the predictive coding theory, the activity at each level of the cortical hierarchy reflects the difference between top-down predictions and feed-forward incoming inputs. It suggests that the brain constantly tries to minimize surprise by predicting upcoming events. So this theory has received a lot of experimental support, but the neurophysiological mechanisms are not well understood. Um, so the usual way to, to look for um, physiological correlates of prediction error in the brain is to look for responses that are reduced when predicted and increased when mispredicted. So this is what happens to responses in the gamma band in the auditory cortex, for instance. And the gamma band therefore constitutes one potential candidate for a neuro neurophysiological uh, correlate of surprise. So according to this and other findings, Wong and, and uh, proposed a model that, that we recycled later and in, uh, in which gamma oscillations propagate feedforward prediction error, whereas beta propagate top-down predictions. But experimental evidence remains scarce and we have, um, as we have largely discussed yesterday. So um, I will propose an alternative approach to test this hypothesis and to provide various uh, indirect supports to this idea. So according to the predictive coding theory, the aim of the brain is to generate predictions to minimize its own surprise. But let, let think about, um, let's think outside of the box, the black box, if my brain aims at reducing its own surprise, others' brains do not seem to care too much to help me in that process. Others' brains, in particular those of young babies, show no interest in letting our brain rest and or let us enter the dark room uh, to minimize our own free energy. Instead, they have developed extremely efficient ways to complain and um, to wake us up brutally <laughs> to get what they need, basically to be fed. So, because they are helpless and they have uh, no other choice but to hijack and take control of our brains uh, using extremely painful auditory stimulation to force us helping them, usually to feed them, uh, apparently the optimal solution for them is to uh, scream. So I won't talk about baby screams today. Um, I've tried to work on baby screams. I started editing baby screams and it's just too painful. <laughs> so, so I'm going to talk about adult scream, which is already very disturbing as you will see. Um, and I will argue that alarm communication signals, in particular screams, aim at surprising the brain to grab our attention. So their aim is um, working against the natural aim of the brain that is uh, minimizing surprise. So I hope to convince you that studying screams, what makes them obnoxious and how they hijack deep parts of our brain, can tell us a lot about the, how the, the auditory system works. So I think that these ideas, indirectly and, and perhaps surprisingly, um, might be relevant somehow to this, uh, to this workshop. So first of all, to ensure the detection of a danger in, by, by the receiver, surprising his brain is essential. In that purpose, um, screams seem to constitute an optimal solution. Screams propagate fast, and unlike facial expressions, they cannot be physically interrupted or perceptually ignored by closing the eyes or when we sleep, for instance. I must say that I was at first quite surprised that um, these unique communication signals have been really scarcely studied in neuroscience. There is an incredible amount of studies that used Ekman faces, the fearful faces, to uh, look at um, emotional reactions in the brain to, to fear. But there is almost no study about screams out there, so um, I decided that that would be my, my niche. Um, and so, yes, yeah, so this is surprising because screams are arguably the most primordial and vital communication signal to promote survival. 
they constitute a unique biological trait and as such a unique research object. Ontogenetically, it's probably the only innate vocalization uh, in humans, but it's also shared between mammals. So it's also very interesting phyl phylogenetically. Um, it's shared between mammals and um, th therefore it possibly constitutes the last common ancestor of vocal communication signals. So for these reasons, I decided to study screams, and I initially reasoned that um, to be processed um, efficiently and exclusively as alarm signals, screams must first be distinguishable from other signals by using specific acoustic features, and second, they should be processed in an efficient and unconditional way by the receiver's brain. <clears throat> So now the question is, how can we measure um, the presence of specific acoustic features in screams, and in general, any auditory signals? So I'm going to describe the modulation spectrum, which is a useful way to represent temporal features of acoustic signals. So the, the, these waveforms here um, represent a 1 kilohertz zone modulated at 25 hertz. And on the right, it's, it's, it's ascendance. And we can decompose these sounds into different frequency bands are using a, band, a bank of bandpass filters um, to mimic the, what the cochlea does um, to provide a time frequency representation that is the spectrogram. And we can then decompose this representation into ripples of different spectral and temporal modulation frequencies um, to obtain the, the mod modulation power spectrum. So here, the y-axis represents modulations in the spectral domain. And we won't really look at that today. We will focus on the x-axis, which represents temporal modulations. So, um, yeah, just one of the, the, the values on the left and the right of the center of this axis here are usually found to be symmetrically represented. So the negative and positive values ref just reflect whether the spectral modulations go up or down. So we don't really care about that. It's just, uh, it's going to be symmetrical. So the question now is how are these spectrotemporal modulations relevant for communication? In a study by the group of Friedrich Tunison, they showed that when selectively filtering the speech signal um, below 30 hertz, so where the red squares are here, speech comprehension is dramatically altered. So you cannot extract the syllabic and phonemic cues anymore. But now if you filter the spectral cues, um, which corresponds to the blue square here, you lose the ability to categorize gender. But accordingly, accord, uh, um, interestingly, according to these authors, the yellow parts of the modulation, modulation spectrum, which corresponds to um, the roughness range, are irrelevant for communication. So the MPS representation shows that acoustic attributes, such as the fundamental frequency in blue, um, and, and the slow fluctuations in green encode distinct information, namely the gender of the speaker and the meaning of speech. However, roughness, which corresponds to the pink square here, is generally considered as irrelevant for communication. So this offers quite a large acoustic space to encode other information. So here, I primarily hypothesize that to avoid false alarms, screams should exploit a specific window. And second, that screams might specifically exploit this region of the spectrum that is represented here. So to test the hypothesis that alarm signals and normal speech sounds exploit distinct frequencies, I recorded four types of vocalization from 19 consenting participants. So the first type was a scream. Ah! That's my scream. Um, and neutral vocalizations ah! uh, without any syllabic or phonetic cues. I also recorded sentences screamed and normally spoken, which are represented here, which results in a two by two factorial design um, where you can assess using the MPS representation whether there is some overlap between screams and speech frequencies. So we calculate the MPS for each of these vocalizations. And then we can look at the sentence factor, which is basically comparing these vocalizations, the modulation spectra of these vocalizations here against this one. And you can see 
that there, the effect specific to sensential information lies uh, below 30 hertz, which is to be expected here. But now if we look at the scream factor, there, where we compare screamed versus normally spoken vocalizations uh, to sentences, we find the effect that is specific to screams, which is basically modulations between 30 hertz and 150 hertz. So what this shows is that screams exploit temporal modulation frequencies in the roughness range that minimally overlaps with those lower ones that are used uh, in normal speech signals. So to check the acoustic specificity of screams, I also compared various types of vocalizations while focusing on the roughness range. So that's what we do here. We take the sounds, we calculate the MPS, and then we just average the values in these uh, windows here, which gives, give us a measure of roughness. So I first compared screams. Where's the mouse? Well, whatever. So screams to normal sentential and musical vocalizations. And found that only screams contain rough cues. I also tested whether such cues could be found in other languages. And I found that no such modulations could be observed in English, in Chinese, or in French. So now it's possible that the fact that roughness is exploited in screams is just happened by chance as in, and is an epiphenomenon of vocal production. One argument to rule this out would be to show that we actually use these frequencies not only when we scream, but, when, um, but also when we need to communicate danger using artificial alarm signals. So I recorded various sounds, um, alarm sounds like buzzers, whistle, whistles, that I compared to instruments that were matched in pitch. So this is a whistle matched with the flutes. Sorry. With the saxophone. OK, so what we find is that artificial alarm sounds are much rougher than instrument um, sounds. So this suggests that artificial alarm sound exploits scream-like frequencies. And this suggests that there's a nice convergence between the selection of natural and artificial communication signals. And this suggests that the use of roughness is not an epiphenomenon, but is rather an adaptation of communication signals to maximize surprise in the brain. OK, so another interesting finding points to a possible origin of uh, dissonance in humans. So in 1877, Helmholtz suggested that the perception of dissonance might origin from rough percepts in uh, dissonant intervals. So if you add two sounds uh, with frequencies F1 and F2, it generates a third frequency at the cochlear level. The hypothesis here is that for that, that intervals uh, for which F3 falls into the roughness range should be dissonant. So I wanted to test this um, and whether it could be shown using the modulation spectrum. And what we observe is that dissonant sounds have larger roughness values than consonant ones. So this suggests that the rough beat percept in scream-like frequencies constitutes one possible origin of dissonance, um, which corresponds to the unpleasantness of sound intervals. All right, so for this first part, we have shown that screams exploit a privileged acoustic attribute, the roughness that minimally overlaps with uh, speech acoustic features. I showed that artificial alarm signals, like buzzers, sound rough, suggesting that this is not an epiphenomenon, but rather an adaptation of communication um, to maximally surprise the brain. And finally, we've shown that rough intervals may constitute one possible origin of dissonance. So this suggests that roughness is, not, is actually not irrelevant for communication. It's presumably useful to communicate about danger and thereby to survive. At this point, I would like to um, highlight a remarkable correspondence co or coincidence between the fact that alarm sounds that use frequencies between 30 hertz and 150 hertz, they aim at surprising the brain. On the other hand, I mentioned the, this hypothesis at the beginning of the presentation that surprise might be propagated using the gamma band, which, is, which happens to use the same kind of frequencies. So, now let's try to do neuroscience with more than a microphone. And um, so the question now I would, like, I, would, I would like to ask is how do these frequencies affect human behavior? 
a primary hypothesis is that roughness, um, um, roughness if, if roughness is, is used for alarm signals, the rougher the scream, the scarier, the scarier it should sound. So I picked all the screams I had, and I asked participants to rate perceived fear on a one to five scale, ranging from neutral to terrified. So then I measured the roughness for each of these stimuli and correlated these, these roughness with the ratings and found that screams with higher roughness are associated with higher fear. And screams with higher roughness are also associated with faster responses. Here. So since roughness accelerates subjective ratings, I also wondered whether scream-like frequencies might facilitate other behaviors, perhaps more directly relevant to uh, behavior and survival. So I used a set of vocalizations that were embedded in white noise and, and were presented either on the left or the right ear. And I looked at the subject's ability to localize these vocalizations. So I, I used three types of vocalization. A neutral vocalization R, a scream, and I also used a synthetic scream, which is basically a neutral vocalization to which I added amplitude modulations in the roughness range. So I measured um, the performance and the reaction times of the subjects. And to account for possible speed accuracy trade-off, I computed the efficiency, which corresponds to the cumulative effect of um, accuracy and response speed. So what we see here is that localization efficiency is much better for screams than for normal vocalizations. But interestingly, we show also that adding rough cues to normal, vo normal vocalizations improve improves localizations, improves localization so that synthetic screams have the same efficiency as screams. So this is really specific to rough cues. In order to refine this finding, I also performed the psychophysics experiments in which participants were required to localize um, sounds that were either presented on the left or the right. But here I manipulated the modulation frequency of 900, 900 hertz pure tones uh, between 5 hertz and 500 hertz. So here I plot the performance and the reaction times as a function of the modulation frequency ranging from 5 hertz to 500 hertz. What this shows is that rough cues improve and accelerate sound localization. Um, so this suggests that my, uh, rough signals might confer an advantage to react faster. It's also interesting to note here that adding amplitude modulations um, to, in the roughness range, no, sorry, above the roughness range at 500 hertz does not improve localization anymore. So what this shows is that amplitude modulation cues need to be in the roughness range, um, not above, to provide usable cues to localize the sounds and improve behavior. So now the question is, what happens in the brain when we listen to these sounds? And in order to investigate the neural dynamics underlying the processing of roughness in the brain, I performed an EEG experiment re replicating the vocalization experiments I did before. So I used the same set of 45 voc vocalizations, 15 in each, in each of these conditions. And as you can see, the ERPs are quite similar and do not really tell us much about how the brain processes these sounds. Um, so in order to exploit the intrinsic acoustic variability between these sounds, I performed a regression analysis using roughness and pitch of each of these vocalizations um, that I use as, as regressors at each time point of the peristimulus time course. So you can see here that there is quite an early effect of roughness on brain responses which occurs at the level of P1 and maybe earlier. But interestingly, you can also observe that um, although pitch and roughness were not correlated at all in the vocalizations, they are concurrently encoded in subsequent N1 and P2 uh, components. But I think here the important finding is that roughness is encoded very early in the brain. So next, my goal was to localize these effects in the brain, so um, to see whether some regions showed any specificity to some subparts of the modulation power spectrum. So I ran an fMRI study during which I presented unpleasant sounds and that I compared with neutral sounds um, 
we used a sparse sampling cardiac gated acquisition. And when we look at the contrast unpleasant versus neutral, we find the amygdala, which is not so surprising. But then I wanted to see whether the amygdala is sensitive to specific subparts of the spectrum. So to do so, I used the reverse correlation approach. Um, I extracted the time course of voxel of interest in both amygdalas and computed correlations with the MPS of each sound. So this allows determining whether one region of interest, such as the amygdala, is sensitive to specific subparts of the, the spectrum, in particular the roughness. So we computed these reverse correlations for all those regions that responded to the contrast unpleasant minus neutral. Um, and importantly, we primarily regressed out um, the valence asso associated with these sounds to make sure that it was not too polluted by the emotional reactions of the subjects. So we found that the amygdala, but not the auditory cortex, is sensitive to roughness. So this might suggest a preferential routing of rough sounds to the amygdala. So the question now is whether the recruitment of the amygdala by rough sounds result from a direct routing of rough cues uh, to subcortical, from sub subcortical auditory nuclei to um, the amygdala or an indirect routing through the auditory cortex. So this remains an open question and, and our results cannot really allow us to firmly conclude about that. But I think it's interesting to remember that the temporal information is downsampled um, throughout the auditory hierarchy. So while low-level nuclei and the thalamus can still sample sounds at 100 hertz, it seems that the auditory cortex prefers modulation, slower modulations uh, around 20 hertz or below 20 hertz, the kind of modulations that we find in speech, for instance. So these together with our finding might support a direct routing of rough cues to the amygdala. On this view, a subcortical pathway would support the propagation of rough sounds to the amygdala to trigger fast responses, whereas the indirect cortical routes uh, would provide slower information, like, like semantic uh, information, for instance, that is useful to modulate and adapt the behavior um, to the context. So the fact that the amygdala is activated by roughness, regardless of the context, whether it's musical or vocalizations, is, is kind of con consistent with this view. So the fast recruitment of the amygdala by rough sound may in turn uh, cause unpleasantness, uh, increase the tension or arousal, and, and speed up the reactions to uh, signal danger. All right, to summarize these results, we've shown that rough vocalizations are subjectively perceived as more fearful. Roughness improves spatial localization. Rough cues are encoded early in EEG responses and rough sounds are encoded in the amygdala. So this suggests first that rough sounds are adapted to maximize perceptual salience or surprise, thereby conferring a, a possible evolutionary advantage to react faster. Rough sounds might maximize early feedforward propagation, possibly through subcortical pathways um, that are involved in fear perception and reaction to danger. So now the question is, how could rough sounds increase perceptual saliency. So let's, let's speculate a little bit about why alarm signals would use these rough cues. If we look at what happens to steady state responses in the auditory cortex, when increasing the frequency of a click train from 25 hertz to 200 hertz, so I'm gonna have you listen to the sound. So this is a nice 25 hertz sound. Beautiful 50 hertz. Very loud, sorry. And 200 hertz. Okay, so you can feel that below 100 hertz, it seems like the percepts are discrete. So you can really hear the clicks in the train. Whereas above the sampling limit here, that may lie between 100 hertz and 200 hertz, these sounds are perceived as continuous. So if we model these responses, steady state uh, responses can be observed below the sampling limit, whereas above this limit, responses are not discrete, but integrated, and perception becomes continuous. Perceive that speech, actually. So here's one hypothesis to explain why alarm signals would be selected to happen in the roughness window. Stimulating below the sampling limit temporarily saturates the auditory system and maximizes neural responses per time unit. This induces unpleasant strobophonic percepts 
that are analogous to strobe light in vision and possibly enhances perception by increasing sensory surprise per time units. So in, in order to refine our understanding of perception around this sampling limit, I performed two more psychophysics experiments. The first one aimed at determining more precisely uh, what is the sampling limit, meaning at which frequency perception switches from discrete to continuous. So I'm, I, done a, I, I did a, a subjective rating experiment where the participants listened to click trains of various frequencies ranging from 50 hertz to 250 hertz. And they had to report whether the sound was rough or smooth, discrete versus continuous. So what the result suggests is that the sampling limit sits around 130 hertz. So again, I would like to draw your attention to the fact that this value, 130 hertz, is not too far from the, the upper limit of the gamma bands. So this might suggest that perception becomes smooth when the stimulus frequency exceeds the limit at which gamma oscillations can be untrained. In a second experiment, I aimed at assessing sensory surprise by measuring subjective unpleasantness. I reason that unpleasantness is a good proxy of surprise. It's, it's a good approximation of surprise. Anyway, um, so what we see here is that unpleasantness seems to depend linearly on the frequency in the pitch range above 130 hertz. And the red dotted line here extrapolates how participants should behave if it was the case below this sampling limit. But interestingly, what we see is that unpleasantness seems to depend linear, uh, sorry, that, that, that unpleasantness is much higher uh, in those regions, especially in the roughness range. So this again supports the idea that sensory surprise approximated by um, subjective unpleasantness is maximized by rough sounds. So given all the results and all the claims I've made so far, it's clear that what we need is um, to show that rough sounds induce responses in the gamma band and that this links somehow to bottom-up propagation of surprise in the brain, ideally in the amygdala. This is not what I'm going to show. So it was my intention, um, though, when I decided to record brain responses to rough sounds in the brain of an epileptic patient who had uh, intracranial electrodes. So the patient had stereotactic electrodes in various regions of the temporal lobe, including the amygdala. So the patient listened to the same set of vocalizations and had to specially localize them. And I was quite excited to look at the data before I found out that the patient was indeed epileptic. Um, the patient had a lot of epileptiform activity. And so I thought that I, I should just trash the, the data because almost 80% of the trials were polluted by epileptiform activity. Um, but this was until I had a discussion with a, a colleague of mine who performed a visual task with this patient that the patient was not epileptic with, during this task. I mean, did not have epileptiform activity. Um, so I thought that perhaps my stimuli were actually driving the epileptic activity, the ep epileptic spiking. So I, I analyzed the, the number of spikes per condition and found that indeed her brain um, did not enjoy listening to screams. But also um, to artificial screams, so vocalizations to which I added roughness. So what we find in this patient is that rough sounds increase epileptic, uh, epileptic spiking in those three shafts here. Um, and that rough sounds also increase the spread of spiking across electrodes, but I didn't show that. So I thought that was quite exciting, and I decided to look in more details about um, to look in more details at this epileptiform activity. So, what you can see here is um, that for these patients, there is typical low frequency um, low frequency epileptiform activity in the temporal pole, the amygdala, and the and the hippocampus. So. <clears throat> What I did then is um, I wanted to compare between the visual task and the auditory task the difference between the, um, the activity during the task minus uh, a period of rest before uh, each task. So this is the activity, the difference between the activity at, uh, during the task and at rest for the phase experiments. So you can see that there is some 
uh, alpha activity, basically. But now if we look at the stream experiment, there's a lot of low, fre low frequency activity uh, on these three, three shafts here that show the epi epi epileptic form activity. So, um, there is quite an important increase in the scream experiment, and we have seen earlier that this seems to relate to the roughness of the sound. So this suggests that scream induce more epileptic form low frequency activity than visual emotional stimuli. So this is not related to the emotion, but rather to the roughness of the sound. So to conclude about these patients, perhaps it's just another case of phonosensitive uh, temporal epilepsy, but I think it's worth uh, investigating if we can find other cases of strobophonic uh, sensitive epilepsy. And here is why. It's very well known that um, it's possible to trigger certain forms of epilepsy, of pho photosensitive epilepsy, in the occipital lobe using strobe lights. So that's the Pokemon phenomenon, not the Pokemon Go. It's another story. Um, so this effect is, is, um, is even used to diagnose these forms uh, of occipital epilepsy and the intermittent photic stimulation is used as a routine diagnostic tool uh, in epilepsy departments. So I've recently came through a very interesting paper from the group of Lopez da Silva linking strobe lights, gamma activity, and occipital epilepsy. And they observed an enhancement of phase synchrony in the gamma band that was harmonically related to the frequency of the stimulation. And this preceded stimulation trials that evolved into photoparoxysmal responses, so the epi epileptic form activity. And this differed significantly from what um, they, they saw in trials not followed by photoparoxysmal responses or in control subjects. Another author um, had even suggested earlier that, that the epileptic brain activity is a direct response to excessive increase in gamma activity. So this is interesting in our case because what we, we, we have shown earlier that, that rough sounds are unpleasant and salient, and I suggested that they might drive gamma synchronization and sensory surprise in the brain. Also interesting in, in, uh, is, is, is the fact that occipital epilepsies occur much less frequently than temporal epilepsies. So simulating in the roughness range using strobophonic sounds can so if, if it can trigger temporal epilepsies, I think that this could be very useful uh, for epileptologists to improve the diagnosis of temporal epilepsy. So my next goal is to test these sounds in as many epileptic patients as possible, still working on the ethics approval for that, and to see if we can reproduce these effects in the auditory modality and potentially derive a useful diagnostic tool for these epilepsies. All right, so to conclude this last part, and go back to the topic of this talk and the sampling limit hypothesis. I've showed that stimulating right below the sampling limits maximizes surprise in the brain. It increases perceptual saliency and behav behavioral performance. It increases unpleasantness. And it can trigger epileptic form activity, possibly in some rare instances, though. Um, so it increases epileptic form activity by increasing bottom-up surprise and synchronization of gamma band signals. Above the sampling limits in the pitch range, neural coding and percepts change. So one possible interpretation of all of these data in the predictive coding framework is that fast stimulate trains exogenously saturate the bottom-up gamma channel across time, which might impede feedback propagation of um, feedback propagation and the deployment of top-down signals. As a consequence, surprise cannot be reduced, which explains the saliency and unpleasantness of such sounds. All right, so um, I'm done with that. Um, so I would like to thank you for your attention and to thank my, uh, my colleagues in Geneva and my collaborators abroad. Thank you very much. Thank you, Luke. So I think we have time for a few questions. Is that there? Yeah, thanks for that. Uh, that was really interesting, uh, compelling demonstration of the surprisingness of the r roughness. But I'm still not totally convinced at the relation to the predictive coding stuff. And um, so 
and my understanding is that there's a distinction between surprise and surprisal. And uh, so the phenomenal, phenomenological aspect of surprise is not necessarily correlated with the error signal that the predictive coding postulates. And I'm wondering if you could do experiments where you uh, get people, you know, you, you manipulate the probability of the screams in such a way that you can get people to uh, predict them and anticipate a way and still uh, detect some sort of, of uh, pr predictive error signal when, when predictions are uh, fail, fail to conform with what happens. Um, I mean, it just seems like, well, it's kind of a lucky coincidence that these are both in the gamma band, but it isn't clear to me that you're, what you're looking at is the same phenomenon. It's only really like an interesting coincidence, and, and, and I agree. Um, perhaps one way to, to look at whether, so I think the idea is, the question is whether predictions could suppress these kind of signals somehow. Uh, so I could work on finding a design where I would try like a repetition suppression design um, to see if these kind of stimuli are less suppressed uh, than other stimuli when we repeat them, I guess. Could that be a um, way to solve the, your problem, or is it more fundamental? <laughs> I think you could at least see whether there are two dissociable signals that, that the brain is making. I mean, the... The gamma that you're talking about is a feed-forward gamma, not a feedback gamma, for instance. At least it seems to me that the signals that you're, that are that you're propagating are, you know, auditory signals going forward, and uh, not a feedback signal. That so it doesn't really have to be in the gamma band. What I'm trying to argue here is that if you just saturate the the, the auditory system with exo exogenous a stimuli per time unit, it would be very hard for the brain to um, send predictions backward because it doesn't have time to send predictions. So it just goes too fast for the brain to generate predictions and therefore to suppress these responses. So I think what we see is just the, the response to a click train is just a very basic transduction of the, of the signal up to the auditory cortex, let's say. And this, so you could imagine that prediction might suppress a little bit, a little part of this response, this automatic response, but it wouldn't, wouldn't be able to suppress all of this response. And what, what, what this system does, what, what you know, 100, click, uh, 100 hertz click train does to your brain is just forcing the propagation of the information uh, in a fit forward manner, and therefore suppresses any of your intents to uh, try to suppress this, uh, because it just goes too fast. So I, I think that's the idea. It doesn't have to be true. It's just uh, the hypothesis. <laughs> Um, that was really interesting. Uh, so you're thinking that the the uh, perceptual salience of screams has to do with them being a surprising stimulus to this uh, predictive system that's trying to minimise or avoid surprise. Um, but uh, would they not also be more uh, salient to any kind of dumber, non-predictive system just because they're occupying a bit of the sort of frequency bandwidth where there's not much in interference from other sounds, particularly sort of at least vocal sounds, it seems like they're um, sort of occupying an unused channel, and so they would get you know sort of better signal to noise. Um, how do you are, they, are these sort of the same idea in some I way? So, yes, yes. Okay. Uh, it's not incompatible at least. So yes, I, I would I would say that. I suppose uh, to what extent are um, is it just that from an information sort of communication point of view, that's a good channel to be transmitting your information on? Or is it, does it depend on the brain being this predictive mechanism that makes it a good reason to, to scream in that frequency? Yeah, it's, it's a good question. I, I, it's hard to answer, but I think what happens and what I'm trying to say when I'm talking about innate vocal, so the you know, phylogenetic, phylogenetic aspects and the ontogenetic aspects is that these vocalizations they emerged a very long time ago, and, and they possibly adapted to the brain, to the brain constraints, to the temporal ability to sample the world. And I think what they're just trying is to ensure, so they were selected because they, they seem to ensure the detection, the, local, the efficient localization, and to, to optimize the behavior. So I think it's part of the same, uh, yeah, I, 
the same process and it doesn't have to be... I don't want to make a too strong claim, claim about predictions, but at the same time, I think it's not uninteresting to think that they impede the propagation of feedback uh, top-down signals. But it's really, again, it's just a hypothesis, and, uh, and this has to be tested using much fancier uh, kind of methods, such as what André has used uh, before with uh, the monkeys. would love to do that with monkeys, for instance, um, and to try to do, yeah, like to test the hierarchy and how the, the hierarchy uh, reflects the propagation of feed-forward information. Yeah. yeah, I was wondering whether the, the, the temporal rhythm of the roughness is by itself very unpredictable. And, and if those, un, those that are more unpredictable, so the, the, the clear rhythm, like a scream that's re relatively using the roughness in, 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 a, in a nice structure is more pleasant than one that is like jittering around um, the, the, this frequency to make it you know, really itchy, if there, there's a, a difference. So that's one, one question. Um, another one, if do all animals have this 40 hertz kind of frequency, or would there be some animals that scream at a different frequency and find that? So, so that's, I think that's an interesting hypothesis that you're proposing there. And, and the third one, I mean, even um, it could just be a very good signal, and it doesn't, you, you know, the, the surprise to bind it to the predictive coding, if you're not responding to a scream, you, you, you would, you know, if, if you have a clear channel of a scream and <clears throat> you don't respond to that, a big surprise will come, right? So you, you, you wouldn't attend to it and so on. So you would, you would, you know, any clear signal that is a warning signal you want to respond to and maybe you're wiring up such that it keeps, you know, it gives you this kind of information. So it doesn't really need to be um, unpredictable by itself. But it is a nice, nice idea that maybe, you know, we, we are optimizing, the, or babies are optimizing just this frequency to really make sure that nothing goes wrong. Yes, no, and yes. No, the other way. Uh, so the first, the first was... was uh, <laughs> so the first one was the, the jitter, I guess. Um, so if you jitter these, these, um, the clicks, it makes the sound just sound, it just sounds more natural. Uh, so you can, you can hear that there is some rhythmic, some rhythmic properties. But um, again, if the idea is to saturate the, the system temporally, you just have to make sure that the two clicks respect the refractory period between two responses. And so I don't think actually that it has to be unpredictable to be unpleasant and surprising. And that's kind of what I liked about the, this hypothesis at the end, is that we're disrupting predictive coding, we're, we're forcing surprise, but not with unpredictable um, uh, stimuli. They're just overwhelming the system, I guess. Uh, so two other questions. <laughs> so what was the, the second one? The frequency across animal kingdom. I have no idea. That's, that would be fantastic to test that. I haven't even tested that the how far we can find these frequencies in the, in, in the mammal uh, and, and in general in the animal kingdom. From what I've heard on YouTube, <laughs> seems like a lot of animals uh, do use these frequencies, but yeah, it's purely, yes. Um, but yes, that, that would be definitely the idea. If, if we want to go to, 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 to claim that the last common ancestor of communication signal adapted at some point to some temporal constraints in the brain of the last common ancestor that started to communicate, then uh, that would be the hypothesis, yes. And the third question was? <coughs> was more a comment, sorry. Okay, yeah, <laughs> that makes my life much easier. <laughs> Thank you. So I think what, what, do you mind going to the mic? So this is a <clears throat> bit more of a comment. Uh, there, there might already be an answer to Adina's question in the field in that um, Peter Diane's group has argued that there is a difference in the brain between certain uncertainty and uncertain uncertainty, and that we've evolved different systems for processing that. So the, uh, the endogenous attentional system evolved to process certain uncertainty. This is where you're, say, looking for a, a monkey in a tree, but you don't know where it is. and uh, that's uncertain. And surprise in that context would be deviation from an expectation. You're looking for a monkey, but then you find a man in the tree. But uncertain certainty would be um, not the endogenous attentional system, but the exogenous attentional system, where um, 
you don't have any expectation at all, and something totally unexpected happens. And that's rooted not in a cholinergic basal forebrain signal like the endogenous attentional system, but in a noradrenergic signal out of the locus ceruleus. Then Yantis has shown, Yonides and Yantis, with you know, decades of work, that it's sudden onsets that drive the exogenous attentional system. So what you're studying with roughness might just be the auditory version of sudden onsets. So it's a bit more of a comment. But That's a very good comment. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> There's a sort of question and comment, but t actually trying to tie together all the questions that we've just had. So what's the difference between this sort of salient surprise and surprise in a prediction error sense? What's the role of um, signal to noise? What's the role of noradrenergic modulation in controlling the salience and, you know, sort of sharp on? So the, 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 thought, the thing that, that I think would be usefully brought to the table to resolve all of these and put them in, you know, in the same sort of uh, construct is the appreciation that predictive coding has with it a way of accounting for salience, and that's um, the precision or the confidence you ascribe to the in incoming sensory stream. So mathematically, predictive coding is also known as Kalman filtering. And an important part of Kalman filtering is the multiplication of the prediction error by Kalman gain. And that Kalman gain is the precision. And a lot of people think that precision is attention. And loosely speaking, if you associate salience with attention, what I think you're, the story that you're telling here is that there's some privileged frequency that is inevitably precise mm -hmm. and that you cannot ignore it. I think that, so I, this is not about pre the, the prediction error that you didn't predict that your baby was going to be You're screaming. Right. You, you know it's screaming and you, you know, you have very uh, profound and useful top-down predictions of that. The key thing is you can't ignore it. Absolutely. I think that's, and that speaks to Lars's point that why can't you ignore it? Well, what are the mechanisms that set the Kalman gain in the brain? One of the key ones is synchronous gain. So the whole point of communication through coherence, for example, or um, the tight coupling between mean activity or sensitivity and fast synchronous oscillations, the whole point of that is it provides an exquisite control mechanism that if you can get your signals into that um, privileged message passing domain where you cannot attenuate them, i.e. ignore them, then you've got for free. I think that's that's your story. So, the salience thing, I think, is 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 the key thing here. It's not about surprise in the prediction yep. error. It's more the sort of the precision. And I think that also relates to the very last point about sort of the expected uh, uncertainty, unexpected un uncertainty, because that second order optimization um, is something that would that any good Kalman filter, or any good brain would ha would have to do. So, th does that is that more what you meant in the sense you? you or did you actually mean that the top-down predictions can't, they can't actually influence what's going on? It sounds more sensible to me that you're saying... I, I think I totally agree with you. Um, I think the, the, the biggest problem here is that I don't, have, I, don't, I don't really have the data to answer your question. And that's what I should do now is to acquire data to really tackle this question. Um, I actually really like the, 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 the idea that it's more precision than the prediction error. And it, it definitely answers uh, a lot of uh, the questions that were, that were asked. No, I, I totally agree. It's a good point. Have I answered the question? Or <laughs> OK, thank you. <laughs> quick one. A uh, quick one. Um, in your EEG data, did you ever look at the gamma frequencies associated with your screams? I tried. Um, it was not spectrally resolved. I mean, enough spectrally resolved to, to find any steady state Entrainment, or so I, no, I didn't find anything like that. But uh, I was looking for it. And, and in your epileptic patients, you uh, didn't have enough data there, or in between the epileptic form activity, did you find any um, evidence for the gamma? So uh, I'm going to do that uh, again. These were like really, really pre preliminary uh, analyses that I was pretty excited to, you know, show. Uh, that's definitely something I'm going to look for. Um, I hope to have also more uh, patients to, to look at that. But uh, that's, that's what people have done in, um, when testing the visual stimuli. So the, using the, the photic intermittent stimulation, they looked at the co coherence in the GABA band. And what they showed is that 
the, sorry, the synchronization, and the higher the synchronization in the gamma band as a response to this um, strob strob stroboscopic stimulus, strobe light. Um, so the strobe light, in, if, if the strobe light increased the gamma synchronization, then was more likely, the, most li mo more likely to, to see photoparoxysmal responses. So that's totally something I will do, but I haven't uh, had a chance to look at. In particular, because the epileptic activity is kind of weird. Uh, it's not super stable. It's not an ERP. It's, uh, it's a strange animal. So um, it's going to require to develop some tool or to use some tools that already exist to, to do that. But uh, yeah, but good point. Hey, look, thanks. It was really, really inspiring. Um, I have one quick question regarding adaptation. Do you know where there is no adaptation for screams no, I, or roughness? I would like to see that. I, I, I don't know. So we don't know any about neural responses, you know, to, to those where they, you know, have different time constants or whether it's just no adaptation. That's that's something I would like to to, to, to look at, but again, I don't have the data to answer. But I, uh, I would hope to fit my story that adaptation would be smaller for rough sounds than, exactly. than for non rough sounds. But also I was thinking perceptually, you know, one of the things that adaptation does is that it helps us to perceive something else, right? Or it kind of like flips us away from but that also doesn't seem to be the case with screams, right? So we are, we are always extremely sensitive to those. So it kind of like doesn't fit also with the adaptation as well, right? Well, I would, I, I would, I would like that there, there, wouldn't, there wouldn't be any adaptation. And I think um, that's what babies want to do, is <laughs> not to let us uh, adapt to these. Otherwise, uh, we won't come anymore to feed them. <laughs> um, and I think that sometimes lead to terrible situations where you know probably know the baby, the shaken baby syndrome, this kind of stuff. This is driven by screams actually, um, and, and long expo exposure to screams uh, end up driving crazy behaviors. And uh, so, but it, yeah, I would like to see no adaptation to these or less adaptation to these sounds. And, uh, and, and what I'm trying to, to say at the end of this talk, um, with this kind of saturation of the of the system, you know the and conditional transduction of the, of the signal um, would be kind of that. Uh, I don't know if you can adapt to this, but maybe there, there's some fatigue or this kind of stuff. It also depends on the hierarchical level you, you look at, uh, whether you're in the auditory cortex or in the brainstem, or, so that's totally something I would like to test. Monkeys would be amazing, yeah, but well, a lot the, of work to, to do. The last one is, are there any pathologies that you know, are oblivious to you know, people that are, not, that are oblivious to screams or rough sounds? That I don't know. Um, so you, you, you think of lesions in, in the amygdala that, that would, that would impede it. I don't know. Really, I don't know. Um, I'm not aware of any of them. I know that, some, that there are some lesions in the amygdala that, in, that impair the, the ability to recognize uh, emotions in the auditory domain, too. Um, but most of the work has been done in vision. I mean, maybe you can use your epileptic patients, right? Because if they, if the scream hijacks their, I mean, what you're saying is that you know they 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 have an epileptogenic form, then you're driving that. Maybe they should actually be less prone to, you know, because their, their circuits are actually not working, you know, the way they should, right? You, you usually have you know um, you know epileptic coming from the amygdala, right? So those subjects, you know, should actually exhibit less responses to screams, definitely after surgery, when it's resected, right? <laughs> and Good maybe point. even before. Yeah. And, and maybe even that before. would be interesting to So let's just hope that uh, they are, they, they end up with a lesion in the amygdala. Is that what you're proposing? <laughs> but yes, I, yeah, I agree. That, that, that would be a good thing to test. Thank you. <laughs>